cannabis as a plant, where it's going, how we're using it in terms of recreational, medicinal applications, and then lead into kind of some of the basic economics of the plant and finalize what we're doing at Loyalist in terms of research and what we're doing in class as a program. So a little bit about myself, um, thanks for the introduction. I did do my PhD at Queen's University in plant molecular biology. And really what that entails is moving genes around between plants, bacteria, yeast, and study how they work. And part of that work is looking at organisms in terms of metabolism, what they do at a molecular level, and in my opinion that directly applies into cannabis. Because when we think about cannabis, we're looking at the metabolism in the creation and synthesis of drugs which are derived through molecular pathways. So I have been teaching within the bioscience program going on six years now, because it's been a little while since we talked last, and I jumped at the opportunity when there was an opening within the cannabis applied science. I think it's a big booming industry. It's going to open up and there's a ton of room for research and development, especially when we consider the medicinal application. And that's kind of where my main interest lies. Part of my project, I did develop and discover a novel protein which directly relates to treatments of antibiotic resistance and cancer. And we're still fighting the battle of pushing that patent through. But every opportunity I see which can help treat various illnesses within the population, I think it's something honorable and we should really push, understand, and develop as a potential treatment. So I kind of have some of the diagrams I did during my PhD. And what we see here is plant cells under a special technique known as electron microscopy. We're looking in so small that we can see the lipid bilayers of individual cells. And we're kind of entering into the protein level of biology. That's kind of where I focus. So I apologize if I am talking too complex again. Yell at me. Tell me to stop, slow down, and explain it another way. And I'd love to. So bear with me. <laughs> so when we look at... Loyalist College and their position within the cannabis industry, we do represent the first program dealing directly with extraction and quality assurance of cannabis programs. Since we opened last year, there has been a couple other colleges opening up. Fanshawe is opening their own program very similar to us. So it's nice to have a local system and college which is frontiering within this field and we're kind of pushing the envelope from an educational and research perspective. And you can see your lab set up here. Um, individual on the left is Andrew. He's been a lab tech and he's a great asset. He pretty much runs the lab. He's running a machine which essentially quantifies and detects the levels of the different drugs within the plant. And here's another individual. She's working our critical CO2 extractor. This is industry standards on how they pull out all the active drugs within cannabis. So I always like asking the audience some questions. I don't want to talk the whole time. So if I ask you what exactly is cannabis, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You can just kind of scream out answers. Plant. plant? Perfect. It is a plant. Sorry? Weed. Weed? <laughs> Some slang? <laughs> it's really hard to make lectures and not make a big joke out of it, so. <laughs> There's a lot of stigma around it. So really, everyone has an idea what this plant is. And when we start to fundamentally look at it and understand it, the complexities really open up. And we can look at this from a biological perspective, cultivation perspective, but we also have to consider chemistry and how we can play with that chemistry to manipulate, pull out the ingredients and drugs that we want, and exclude the ones that we don't want. So when we say what is cannabis, it's not an easy answer. It is a plant, it is weed, it's a fun time, it makes things interesting. It's a potential medicinal treatment for various diseases. And one good question to ask yourself, is all cannabis the same? And that's a very difficult answer because it's not the same and we don't really know how we can fully distinguish the different strains, the different plants, and when we delve into the active ingredients, it gets even more complex. So the emerging picture of cannabis is not an easy topic to address, 
So I'll kind of skim the surface today. I could talk all night if you really wanted to and go into super detail, but we'll kind of address the main concepts, what's going on in the field, and what is our current opinion on this plant. Starting with cannabis history is typically kind of the go-to topic when we bring up this plant. And cannabis has a vast history. Some of the earliest evidence of up to 12,000 years ago, archaeologists have found hemp fibers loft in tombs around civilizations, using it mostly as a fiber, clothing, and rope. So humans and cannabis truly are synergistic. We've been around each other for many, many years, 12,000 years as evidence dictates. So we're really dependent on each other, and that reflects in the unique nature of this plant. There's not many plants like cannabis. 2,700 years ago, there were fragments documented as part of a pharmacopoeia, which is the use of cannabis as a drug. So 2,700 years ago, there was some evidence that individuals were consuming plants for their benefits. 2,000 years ago, documentation in Hindu text. So now we're starting to see the globalization of this plant. It's not localized. It's going around the world, and it's a plant worth trading within populations. More recently, 1970, Federal guidelines, mostly in the United States, did classify cannabis as a Schedule I drug. And to me, that's pretty amazing when you look at the other drugs within this schedule, such as meth, heroin, and the things that really plague our society. So I'd like to address a little bit more about that. And you probably can't see this very well, but really what this picture is displaying is the globalization and the history of cannabis within the last 6,000 years and largely originating out of the Asian countries, <coughs> India and China, is what we think where this plant came from, and it's really diversified globally from that. So part of our history, when we first look at the use of cannabis, begins in the 1800s, where largely the British Empire, when they started colonizing North America, pushed hemp as a product. And that product was mostly to go into the synthesis and creation of rope and sails for their empire. And this was a major crop and was pushed quite heavily within the population. 1822, largely since this was such a successful plant, Parliament started pushing more money, more resources into not only cultivating, but also processing and using these fibers for practical sense, such as ropes, sails, clothing, and everything else that we can imagine with hemp. 1917, there was a new machine developed specifically for this purpose to start to extract the fibers. Cotton did also start to compete within this sector. So here we first start to see competing interests with other industries, other crops, and other individuals against hemp. 1923, a jump in the complete opposite direction. The Cannabis Act was um, a bill proposed by the Drug Act Amendment, which prohibited largely opium and other negative drugs, and cannabis was kind of thrown in last second. And from all of the information and all of the evidence out there, largely what caused this <coughs> illegal move against cannabis was the paper pulp industry and lobbyists, because hemp has the potential to completely outcompete paper and pulp. So I won't take too much from John's talk, but hemp's an amazing plant, so I look forward to what he has to tell us tonight. 1937, laws really started to amp up, and you can see what looks more like a soldier starting to fight against this crop. And I think that's something very interesting where a couple hundred years ago, this was pushed on the population to grow. It's so valuable that we're going to encourage as many people as possible to grow this product. And now someone's coming at me with a Tommy gun telling me not to grow it. So things get very confusing when we look at the history of this plant. 1962, the glory days of cannabis. The baby boomers started to divulge and get a taste for this plant. So in 62, it gained significant popularity. 69, the Canadian government formed the Royal Commission of Inquiry on Non-Medical Use of Drugs. So not only are the United States starting to crack down on the use of cannabis, 
It's also bleeding into Canada, where they're really starting to push against the use and try to get it out of society. 1972, there were federal governments which removed a lot of the criminal penalties for possession of cannabis. So largely, what was going on in this situation, they realized that a big chunk of the population had an interest in this plant. They liked it, they used it. To fight that level of interest within the population would cost quite a bit. So by decriminalizing it, they can kind of diverge some resources away from that and start to open the doors of the pathway of legalizing it. 96 was a big case. Terrence Parker was an epileptic patient and he found that cannabis was one of the few drugs that actually prevented his seizures. And from molecular studies that we have today, this is a very positive drug that works against epilepsy. So he was onto something. He started growing his own plants, making edibles so he could self-treat himself. And he was arrested and a lot of his liberties were taken away from him. So he went into legal battles where in 2000, the Ontario Court of Appeal did find that the um, cannabis prohibition was un unconstitutional. So it took a lot of his rights away to treat himself, have a high quality of life, and potentially get over this crippling disease. 2001, there was the first rendition of medical cannabis law. So now it's not quite legal for individuals to grow this plant, but if you had a license, there was a niche for this plant, the drugs created by the plant. So licensed cultivars could start to grow this and use this product as a potential drug treatment. 2003 and four, there was a big move by the federal liberals to start to decriminalize cannabis to the point of legalization, but it never really got through and the bill failed. 2006, we took a little step back from a cannabis perspective the conservative government did impose a mandatory jail sentence if you were caught growing or dealing the drug, which without a license, I can not see some potential meaning behind that. But from the way everything was going up until that point, that was considered a step backwards. And 2011, 2016, again, there were more battles in court with the medicinal use of cannabis. And that leads into where we are today, 2017, was the initial written um, enactment of the Cannabis Act where it was put into place in 2018. So there's a bit of history with this plant. But what exactly is cannabis? Can anyone tell me what that organism is? Hops. Hops. Hops is the sister plant of cannabis. They're very tightly related. They're almost identical when you look at the molecular and genetic side of things. And it's interesting how we jump on plants that have value and they have related species of value. So hops, very important ingredient for brewing a beer and cannabis, very important for recreational and medicinal applications here. So when we look at cannabis as a biologist, we can <coughs> classify all cannabis as a single species. And that species is cannabis sativa. And you usually see this little L Carl Laminas was the individual who was in charge and largely pioneered the classification of plants. And he was the individual that largely put cannabis into a single species. From that, and I'm sure you've heard of a couple of the subspecies, Sativa, Indica, and Ruderalis, they are separate entities that look, act, and grow completely different. But when you look at the genetics of this plant, it's very difficult to distinguish the difference between these three. So that is why there's only a single cannabis species, but there's hundreds and thousands of strains which can be made from that single species, and each one of those strains are completely different. In terms of application, high THC variants, that's the recreational side of cannabis, has undergone a ton of hybridization. So due to the interest, the prohibition, the underground cultivation of this plant, there's been a lot of work breeding, crossing out these species. So it gets very much more complicated when we try to put these plants into a category. 
So it's hard to discriminate the difference at the genetic level when we're growing it, we're looking at it and using the active ingredients. It is easy to see a difference. And by looking at the three main subspecies, you can see immediately how different they are. So sativa is typically the bigger, more active plant, high in THC. Indica, very closely related to sativa. It's also part of the recreational and medicinal community. It has a higher CBD content usually. <coughs> and ruderalis, pretty much everyone ignores that. That is the weed of the weed. It's an auto-flowering. It's very difficult to grow and work with. Once you plant it, it's programmed to do something. And you can't really play with the drugs in it that much. So it is an important plant, but everyone kind of ignores it and throws it away. So. <laughs> Feel bad for the ruderalis. <coughs> when we look at these subspecies, indica, um, from its origin, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly where the plant started and grew and evolved from, but there's a lot of people who have interest in this. And the accepted origin for indica is India. If you look at the name indica, India, we do see a relationship there. In terms of cultivation, this plant typically matures in 45 to 60 days, but you also have the option to manipulate its growth cycle and extend or shorten that. Plant features, it's typically short, sturdy, bushy, very big, thick, wide leaves compared to sativa. And its bud features, which is the flower which contain the most drug, are typically very dense with pigment, they smell, they have a strong aroma, and they typically appear purple in coloration. And I'll come back to that in a moment. In terms of application, largely people associate indica with the treatment of insomnia, chronic pain, anxiety, and loss of appetite. But I'll put a big asterisk beside that because through hybridization, it's not usually a rule, but kind of an accepted theory. Sativa usually the bigger plants, was found mostly in equatorial climates, so Thailand, South Africa, and Mexico. Again, it's hard to pinpoint its exact origin. Most people accept Chinese areas, such as Thailand, more than Africa or Mexico, but again, due to globalization, it's found in usually the warmer climates. In terms of cultivation, it typically does take longer, 60 to 90 days. But again, you can manipulate this largely through the amount of light you put on your plants. Its features quite a bit taller with thin leaves, and its buds are lighter. They're usually quite a bit smaller, and they have more of a fruity aroma with hints of red and oranges. And largely, this plant is used to treat things like creative blocks, <laughs> lack of focus, depression, and fatigue. I really like sativa, also because hemp is a strain or a subspecies within sativa. And hemp itself is an amazing plant. So largely, sativa is grown specifically for the industrial use of its derived products. Hemp has a lot of fiber, it's got a lot of oil and a lot of essential amino acids as a food product. So it's one of the most beneficial plants within this family. Hemp's also very fast growing. And those are the initial evidence of cannabis use up to 10 to 12,000 years ago around <coughs> hemp itself. And you can see the amount of products you can make out of this. And I really focus on things like paints, plastics, biofuel, food. We can start to compete with traditional oils, fossil fuels, plastics, and kind of start to use a more biological, degradable, and organic product. The biggest difference, though, between these two species, when we look at cannabis as marijuana, the more drug-oriented one, and hemp, has to do with the chemical makeup. THC is the psychoactive drug within cannabis, and you can see with hemp, it's usually held at a threshold of less than 0.3%. Anything above that, marijuana, 5 to 35%, is typically the levels that you can start to observe there. Aside from that, the psychoactive activity lacking in hemp, how it's used in cultivation and the products derived from that are more physical. If you really get bored tonight, you can go home and look up hemp car body. You can make bodies for cars out of this material. It's very rigid, very tough. Like it takes a hammer to it at one point and the hammer just bounces off. 
but it's an amazing product. One thing that's always bothered me is how hemp falls under the Cannabis Act. To me, I look at these two species or two subspecies, and they're two drastically different plants, but they fall under the same act. Hemp has been illegal for many years. They did open up the cultivation of hemp quite a bit sooner than marijuana, but today with the Cannabis Act, you can't grow hemp as readily as any other crop. So hemp largely is the strongest natural fiber on this planet. The applications are extensive for textiles, material, oils, food. It's an amazing plant. And this kind of goes back to our history with cannabis and how we've been interacting with it for so long that we've almost developed together. And cannabis really reflects a lot of what we need in society today. So here you can see some pictures of the plant, hemp being a tall, skinny um, plant, up to 20 feet tall. So we have a lot of stem tissue found on hemp. Most of the leaves are concentrated at the top, and the stem is where we find a big chunk of the fibers for use. Where marijuana is typically shorter, bushier, more leaves, and much bigger buds, which are the flowers found at the top. And here you can kind of see a comparison of the buds. So now we go into the fun part of cannabis. Thanks for some of us. So recreational cannabis is the use of the plant, the drug THC, for our benefit and any sort of pleasurable outcome that we want to derive from that. So another question I always like to kind of throw out there, when we look at the Cannabis Act, recreational marijuana, a wonderful thing or a major health risk? And depending on who you ask, we can argue both sides of this. There's always an age-related aspect to health. Obviously, we don't want young people with a developing brain to divulge too much and consume too much THC, especially with what we know about neurobiology. But there's also a lot of benefits from a recreational side as well. I'm going to kind of skim the surface and talk about what the main ingredients are, lightly talk about how they work, and some of the applications there. So when we look at recreational cannabis, mostly we're after a set desired effect. You can see a list is quite extensive. They do increase from that. So relaxation and euphoria, just to hang out at the end of the day, get a tough day at work, you want to relax, go to bed at a decent hour. General alteration of consciousness and perception. Some people love that, some people don't. Increased awareness of sensation. Increased libido, can't go wrong with that. Distortions in the perception of time and space, heightened sensory perception, and increased appetite. So really, hungry, happy, sleepy is the benefit of cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing we really have to understand about cannabis is we have a neurological system within us that directly interacts with these drugs. So I don't expect you to make much sense out of this. You just have to trust me a little bit. But this is the natural endocannabinoid system within our neural cells. And what that means is we have a neural network that binds to molecules such as THC and it modulates and modifies how our brain and our neural system works. We also produce our own cannabinoids. They're a little bit different, but largely the overall structure, you can see at the bottom here, are the same. And they're important for things like short-term memory, how we see the world, how we perceive things, and even how our brain can focus on things. And how we listen to music. <laughs> Pink Floyd just got a little bit better. One thing that I always found really interesting is the natural endocannabinoid systems within our brain largely <laughs> slow down the communications between neural cells. So it allows us to focus on something and drop it for something more important. When you flood that system with THC, whatever you're focusing on becomes the most profound, amazing thing you've ever heard or seen of, and you can really hyper-focus in on that. And there is some beneficial use to that, especially when we're going down the world of ADD being plagued within our education system. Maybe instead of just hammering kids with things like Ritalin, 
we can modify one of these drugs. We don't want a room full of high kids, but if we can take the psychoactive means out of THC and allow an increased focus, I can see a big potential there. And listen to Pink Floyd. So the cannabis compounds, how they interact with our system is complex. There are two main pathways within our body. The first one is known as the CB1, and that's largely isolated to our brain and our central nervous system. So that modulates what we see, how we interact with the world, what we think. And CB2 is more of a peripheral system. So it's found throughout the rest of our body. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is the immune system. So cannabis has the potential to alter the way our immune system works. And I think that's very important here. When we look at cannabis, the big question that we have to concern ourselves with is what are the drugs, how do they work, and what concentration are they found, and how do we pull them out and isolate the ones we don't want. So natural cannabinoids found in cannabis, these are the main ones that we tend to focus on. So THC, CBD, I'm sure everyone's heard of that. That's the more medicinal side of things. And there's a lot of other ones that you may not have heard of. So CBN is the couch lock cannabinoid. That's good for if you're not sleeping and you need to go to bed a little bit earlier. CBN is going to be a great drug for that. It's also very difficult to accurately look at these cannabinoids and predict how many there are. So I have a stat here that reports have stated that there's 100 plus cannabinoids within cannabis. I've heard 300 plus. So it really depends who you ask and at what level are you studying the plant. So I'm a little bit more conservative. We'll stick with 100 plus. Easily we can say there's at least 100 cannabinoids within cannabis. And we only focus on five or six of them. So this is where there's a black hole in our knowledge. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what these cannabinoids do, but there's a lot of potential application here. They're also discovering them. So not too long ago, they've uncovered two new cannabinoids found within the plants. They're very psychoactive, much more psychoactive than THC, but they're also found in very low concentrations. So it was less than 1% of the total plant mass had this these two cannabinoids in them. So this just proves that when we start to focus on a plant or a drug, put money into it and research it, we can better understand it, we can make new discoveries, and perhaps these discoveries have great beneficial application in medicine. <coughs> with the endocannabinoid system and anything associated with neurobiology, it's very complex. So here, Cannabinoids aren't everything, and there's a lot of other active drugs in cannabis that have largely been ignored in the past that were uncovering a lot of therapeutic beneficial effects. Has anyone heard of the entourage effect? Similar to the entourage show on TV. So this is something that's fairly new, where we can look at things like CBG, a cannabinoid, Delta-8 THC, the psychoactive cannabinoid. But we also have flavonoids and terpenes and all these other components within cannabis which impacts how we perceive that drug. So looking at the entourage effect is beyond just THC, just CBD, but it's the whole family of these drugs found in the plants which can interact with our CB1, CB2 receptors within our brain and cause all sorts of beneficial effects. So first one we tend to focus on are terpenes. Terpenes are found everywhere in nature. So when you look at the smell, the taste, the properties of any sort of plant, an orange, a lime, pine needles, it's largely terpenes which give it those properties. And what we're looking at is a volatile molecule. It dissipates very easily. That's why it has a strong smell. And all evidence that we're seeing so far is that these terpenes can interact with the same receptors that THC binds to and alter the way they perceive that drug. It's not easy to kind of get your head around that. No. <laughs> Flavonoids are also a new chemical that we're starting to focus on. 
And largely when we see flavonoids, it's the coloration of plant products. So the purple kush, the rainbow kush, all these orange, red, purple colors that we see are due to the profiles of flavonoids potential within these families of chemicals. So looking at the total spectrum of cannabis, now you can start to see the complexities in terms of chemistry. And it's not easy to work with, understand, and discover them. And you can see by this complex figure what is involved with plants. And there's a lot going on here. So all compounds, when we consider the entourage effect, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, and the flavonoids, work together, whether that's a recreational side or medicinal side. And we kind of need this whole family of chemicals within the plant to really understand the therapeutic benefits here. Going to more of a medicinal side, medicinal cannabis deals with the exact same chemicals. So typically we don't worry a whole lot about THC. THC is still important in medicinal cannabis, but we don't want 35% THC to blow our faces off just to get over an illness. So typically we're looking at a strain of cannabis with much less THC and much more CBD. In terms of how medicinal cannabis is used, I just kind of threw this in last second before I came here. Smoking is typically the more common one, but with smoking, there's a lot of medicinal negative effects. So there's a lot of experts in the industry making things like edibles, oral sprays, pills, capsules. There's more than one way to consume or get this product onto you. So there's a lot of advancements in terms of medicinal cannabis. And here, I just want to show you again some complexity, so don't pay too much attention to the detail. This is known as nature's pharmacopoeia. And what I want to iterate with this point is every drug that we take in society was initially derived largely from a plant. There are examples of fungus and bacteria, but here you can see drugs such as aspirin, taxol for chemotherapy, um, digitoxin for cardiac, are all plant metabolites and THC, CBD, terpenes, cannabinoids, all fall under this family of drugs, as we'll call it. So going back to the endocannabinoid system, imagine the complexity with the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids, how they're binding to our neural cells and our immune cells. There's a lot of research to be done here. So in terms of our full understanding, we're in the early days, and largely this is the exciting days as a researcher. But I have a quick example here, CB1. CB1 receptors found in the brain, when they bind to those receptors, you get things like increased appetite, decreased body temperature. Those receptors throughout the body, such as liver, can help modulate things like glucose sensitivity, insulin synthesis pathways, there's a lot of application with diabetes and metabolism, fat burning properties, really we're scratching the surface and there's a lot of potential that we can open up here. In terms of CB2, affecting our immune system, terpenes and cannabinoids are known anti-inflammatories. So when it comes to things like pain, cancer, inflammation is usually the worst enemy. As soon as you have inflammation, it causes more mutations, more cancer, more pain, where medical cannabis can help alleviate that. So intestinal inflammation, this is a good example. Anatomine is our natural endocannabinoid that our body produces. So within the intestinal cells, this natural endocannabinoid, when bound, can increase wound closure, decrease secretion, decrease visceral pain. Cytokines are the inflammatory hormones our body produce. So if we can prevent inflammation, prevent pain, and help alleviate a lot of the symptoms of these diseases, I think it's something we should really push for as a society. There was another figure I had, it was a little too complex, and I apologize, it probably is too complex. But THC can bind to the exact same receptors as opiates do. 
So from the opiate pandemic itself, if we can start to alleviate and decrease the usage of opiates, we can save millions of lives, especially in the United States and Canada. Here's another example of intestinal cancer. And I always hesitate when it comes to cannabis and cancer. Weed will not cure cancer. But maybe with research and engineering deriving these drugs, we can start to use these drugs with traditional chemotherapies to help increase the odds of survival, help the patient increase their appetite, decrease inflammation, and that will push towards a better treatment for that individual. So here, this again, our anatomy and our natural endocannabinoid can increase what's known as apoptosis. And that's convincing a cell to kill itself. And I think that's very advantageous if you convince a cancer cell to kill itself instead of growing uncontrollably. And you can see apoptosis goes all the way across every one of these neural or immune pathways that endocannabinoids can bind to. So how can we use cannabis cannabinoids to hijack these systems, hit cancer cells to tell them to kill themselves? That's a big, big question. Again, research is emerging. So this was released in January 30th, 2020, where they found that one of the cannabinoids, CBG and CBC, can kill cancer cells. Mind you, this isn't a research setting, so it's not within an individual. It's cells growing in a lab, being treated and hammered with these drugs, but so far, it's proving to kill them. So that is something very important and something to worth further investigating and understanding how that is occurring within the biology and human cells. Alzheimer's disease, again, another disorder plaguing our society. What cannabis can do in this case, again, understanding that it decreases inflammation. The biggest issue with Alzheimer's is you have neural cells dying, and that stimulates the immune cell system, which causes inflammation and causes more neural death. So if we can treat these cells, and you can see the little red cannabinoid receptors, and prevent them from cascading and killing themselves, we can prolong prognosis for Alzheimer's patients and couple that with new emerging drugs and perhaps eventually come to a cure. So when we look at the complexity with the cannabinoid system and potential diseases, and I use this more as a shock, uh, awe, I can't even speak anymore, shock and awe figure where you can see known diseases and known benefits with cannabinoids. So here, disease and health benefits, anti-inflammatory, arthritis, cramps, migraines, there's a lot of potential. And there actually is a clinical trial in Canada with cannabis and migraines right now and breast cancer. So the evidence is showing it's pretty positive. A couple other ones, Alzheimer's, antidepressants, MS, the list is very extensive. And again, you can see CBD is a very common one here. Is that just because that's where most of the studies have been? Yes, it's a big focus. Um, it tends to be the non-psychoactive cannabinoid, which has unique properties as well. So when we look at the cannabinoid evolutionary pathway, we think it's a lot of defense mechanisms. So against infections, against UV. So it's naturally protective. So if we incorporate our system with this naturally protective molecule, we can see a lot of benefits. But a lot of it is biased because that's where the focus is, for sure. Yes? So those white dots up there, the columns that don't have any white dots, do they have to extract those things from the plant for yep. it to do what it's supposed to do? As of now, yes. Um, but again, as we're starting to discover more and study more, we're starting to see that maybe throwing in THC with CBD is much better for killing pain. So largely we look at CBD as a painkiller. THC can modulate that and make it an even better painkiller. 
But then you have to play with, oh, I took a pain pill and I'm listening to Pink Floyd now. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of play with that. So these plants that are like not plants, but companies that are starting up all over to grow, are they doing it for the re like the research, or are they doing it? Why are they, Why is there so many? Starting up. As an industry, um, most industries start the way of they want to secure their funding. So almost all companies right now are entering more of the recreational path, but with that income, they're starting to spend more in R&D and quality assurance. So we work very closely with a couple companies. Metafarm is our great friends at Loyalist, and they started with extracts mostly for recreational use, but now they're starting to open their own R&D. And this is where they're going to go. Where are they located? In Barry. Okay. Yeah. Because if you can crack the pharma game and you can find a painkiller alone, you're a rich individual. So, and I think that's in the back of the mind of these businessmen who are funding. So, yeah. Does the federal government or provincial government do any Yes. Not as much. Um, Provincial isn't funding as much as they have in the past. The federal will do startups, but typically to get funding, especially for research, they want equal, equal partners with industry. And the biggest problem with R&D is industry wants to turn around in their income, and R&D can take five to 10 years before they develop a product. So that's kind of where we're sitting right now with expectations from a business side to research development of these novel drugs and potential products. So, industry is securing their income with recreational use and give that five years and they'll start to pipe that into R&D. And we're kind of seeing elements of that. Yes? So basically, the white dots show or indicate that those are the ones that immediately drew your attention? Yes. And had the most effect on yeah. health or whatever? So we look at Alzheimer's. When we look at Alzheimer's, there's evidence that CBD works. There's evidence that CBC, CBG, THC, THCA all work. Yeah. But it's a matter of let's develop this drug. Let's increase the efficacy, the way it works, and not get that psychoactive negative component. That's and how old is the research now? A lot of it's anecdotal. <laughs> um, there is emerging molecular evidence. So when we look at the receptors... There's protein-protein interactions. There's a lot of evidence that they bind, that they decrease inflammation. So I always go down a path of molecular work, and it's out of the scope of the talk today. But there is a lot of fundamental and empirical evidence that this because thing is the, true. You know, the, the, the microglia are affected, but I would imagine that they affect all the uh, glial system, the whole glial system. Yeah. We don't know yet. But exactly. So. Great, yeah. That's where drugs are right now. We're in an era where people want targeted drugs. How do I hit just this neural cell and not this neural cell? And that's the big thing we need to crack open in medicine. And there's a lot of work and a lot of potential application within that field. This just increases the complexity of that. And the research is young. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's where they make the money? The Recreational right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but if they make a different drug... Oh. They pass that, they're, they're good to go. They're good on me. Yeah. We look at the money in Big Pharma right now. It's staggering how much money that they go through. So. And these lists go on forever. So I could sit here and just talk about therapeutic application of cannabinoids alone. But again, whenever you see something like this, whether it's true or not, I think it's worth investigating. There's some evidence that these cannabinoids can help treat cancer. It won't cure cancer, but the potential of treating it, increasing the odds of survival, or making the patient feel better, or have an appetite, get their strength up. And I think that is very advantageous where we are today. So maybe 10, 20 years down the road, we can develop one of these cannabis-based drugs that can kill cancer. But as of right now, Losing the symptoms, helping the chemotherapies work better by decreasing inflammation is a very beneficial route to go down. 
So now we start to look at the markets, and there is a lot of teetering on the market today. But before we saw what we did this year, the North American markets um, early on in legalization, so 2018 is kind of when a lot of these stats start, was about $12 billion across North America. Most of that is in the United States, so 10.4 billion, where Canada was sitting at 1.6 billion. But that's not money just to kind of ignore. Market research analysts have suggested by 2021, it'll be worth $24.5 <coughs> billion. And up until recent, it was going to hit that point. So I like using local businesses. Um, as a class at Loyalist, we like to go around to these companies, see what they're doing, how they're doing it, network with individuals. And one company we went to was Tweed. So if we look at that from an economic perspective, in Smith Falls, they bought the old Hershey's factory, so now we don't have a derelict building sitting there rotting. They're using it, it's functional. They're growing a lot of cannabis out of that building, and they've employed near 2,000 individuals. So they've kind of changed the scope of Smith Falls. They brought a lot of money in, they brought a lot of business. Unfortunately, Canopy, who owns Tweed, did take a big hit, and it seems that mostly it's the cultivating companies that are getting hit the hardest right now. But in terms of where we're going, um, in Canada alone, the pot industry, another good word instead of weed, has added nearly $7.24 billion to our GDP in August. So again, it is taking a bit of a hit, but that's a big number. That's a lot of money to put into our economy. It's a lot of jobs, it's a lot of infrastructure, and it's a lot of development within the industry. So legal cannabis spending, looking at medicinal versus recreational, this is where we can see the company's strategy of securing income through a recreational use and then funneling some of that money into medicinal research. And again, it is lacking, but I think it will pick up. Yes? There's a lot of talk about um, the factory growing pot being full of chemicals and maybe even like pesticides and things, which comes along with a lot of indoor grows. Is that a concern of that stuff contaminating you know, for medical use? And the Cannabis Act is crazy when it comes to pesticides. If you, use, if you use pesticides, it has to go under an insane amount of testing. So largely indoor grow-ups don't use pesticides. Their biggest strategy is to avoid any sort of infection. So when you go into the facilities, it's double door. You're walking through an airlock. You're walking through bleach mats. And the whole thing is to... Don't go into the wild, pick up a pest and bring it into the facility. Those who do use pesticides, there's analytical means to assess. So high um, pressure liquid chromatography doesn't mean anything, but really it's a means to look at each individual molecule within the plant. And there's strong regulations when it comes to pesticides. So parts per billion are accepted. If you go over that threshold, the product needs to be dropped. And that's one thing that the Cannabis Act has done really well. They want to monitor not only how much THC, how much CBD, but they want to ensure that there's no pesticides on these products for direct human consumption. And the industry's been very good about that. Yes? Can you say, sorry. Well, just as a quick follow-up, something I'd um, sort of add to that is it's similar to the food industry, my understanding is that there are banned pesticides yeah. that they're very good at testing for, but just in the way that you know any food that you buy has been uh, treated with pesticides unless it's organic, those pesticides are still used. Well, even organic foods are treated with pesticides too. As an organic farmer, I would say it depends on the farm. It does depend on the farm, yeah. Yeah, but it's more strict, yeah. I think. But you're right that it's very, it's very yeah. well tested for dangerous pesticides. There's a list of... Like yeah, there's a very specific list of what pesticides you can use. Yeah, yeah it's about 14. Yeah, what is your thoughts on radiation to all the big facilities? Because they're irradiating, so they're really killing white robes is their biggest concern, so people will get sick. Yeah. Um, there is a place for it, especially for immunocompromised people, but it also alters the profile of cannabinoids. Absolutely. Yeah, so radiation will chemically alter everything. And I just made a lecture a week ago about that, where 
you do see a drop of up to 20% of a lot of these drugs. So we're at a point now where how do we grow these plants, especially indoor, to minimize all that. Outdoor, you have biology to help you out. So with pests especially, you have natural predators. So if you get something like thrips or um, another common one, mealybugs, aphids, ladybugs will come in and other predators. So you will have that battle, you will have to deal with it, and maybe outdoor ops will be quite different from indoor. Indoor will probably bias towards medicinal, outdoor cool. So in terms of jobs, we are seeing an explosion. Here we see a graph of job openings done by Glassdoor analysts, and again, we can see an increase in number. Um, this is just in 2018, so there probably was a dip, especially in 2019. And that's kind of where we're at right now, where there is a bit of stalling in the growth of this industry. So some companies, um, this particular company in BC laid off 500 jobs, they closed two greenhouses, and again, I think a lot of this is due to the hype from the business side of things to grow almost beyond what we can handle, and they're sitting on too much product right now. So, How would you sell it? Where I'd make it cheaper. It? I'd compete with the black market. <laughs> <laughs> So, there are hardships. I've been talking personally with companies in the area, especially GTA, and they're still growing exponentially. So, depending on the field, the industry, and where these companies are located, there are companies dying for workers right now. And they've approached us begging for us to increase enrollment and get more students out. So just to wrap things up, um, in terms of Loyalist College, it's nice to have a footprint within this industry locally. So Dr. Carrie Cramp has made a lot of work and a lot of groundbreaking movements within the industry, receiving a $1.75 million grant to establish a lab. And largely what she's doing with this lab, it is Canada's first um, technology of access center. So that's a pretty big thing for this area is she's helping local industries make new products, uh, quality assurance, test for pesticides, make sure they reach those thresholds. And it's very good to have this next door. It's brought a lot of attention to Belleville and the Quinty area. And I think that's very beneficial for people looking to get into cultivation, growing, extraction, to bring more business into this environment.